as we usually do, we speak on the Pasha of the week. And this week we have a double header. We have two full Pashis. It's on, yeah. Two full Pashis. And each Pasha in itself, of course, is full with all kinds of, of uh, significant messages for us. We will try to touch on both Pashas and um, get an understanding and then, of course, something that is pertinent for ourselves. The Pashas are Chukas and Bolok. Chukas is called so because it talks about the Chukas, the, the decree of the Torah. That's how the Pasha starts. But this is the decree of the Torah. This is a unique expression used with, in association to the word Chukah. Everybody knows that there are three categories in mitzvahs, right? Eidois, Chukim, and Mishpat. Is everybody aware of this? Eidois are testimonial mitzvahs that are attesting to some kind of a historical event, such as Shabbos. Shabbos is among the mitzvahs of Eidois. It attests to the fact that God created the world in six days and the seventh day he rested. And every time Shabbos comes around, it reminds us of this, of this fact. All the holidays are of this category. Pace of Shavuos and Sukkis are of this category. Eidos. To me? Feeling is an oasis, Mizuz is an oasis, there are many things that are, that are oasis. Then we have mitzvahs that are in the category of mishpoti. These are mitzvahs that encompass all interhuman rules, how people behave in their interactions. You're not allowed to steal, you're not allowed to rob, you're not allowed to lie, and uh, you should deal in business honestly, and so forth. And then there are chukim. Chukim are in a category all by themselves, in that chukim do not lend themselves to human understanding. Mishpotim are entirely, basically, um, um, on, the, on the human intellectual level. Not to say that we can understand every nuance, every aspect of the laws that the Torah presents. No way. These are not laws that are made by human um, logic. And there's no way that we can possibly explain all the details of any halacha in the Torah. Nevertheless, the very fact that this halacha exists is something which, which makes sense. We understand why these laws exist, because, because they guide our practical life, so we can relate to them. Eidois, likewise, even though these are the mitzvahs that we would not think of ourselves, but nevertheless we can relate to them and make sense, so to speak, uh, in human orientation. You have to remember your history, you have to remember what happened in the past in order to understand your, your present and your future.
one of the primary mitzvahs we always say in the everyday Laman Tizkoir that you must remember you must remember the day you left Mitzrayim and it, uh, this is imperative it's important to remember but it's not something that one would think of himself maybe should give us this mitzvah but it lends itself to our appreciation Chukim are in a different category completely Chukim are beyond our comprehension what does it mean you must not wear shotnays for instance shotnays a mix of wool and wool and um, and linen thread joining a garment from two types from, from a little piece of linen and a little piece of wool you're allowed to wear linen and on top of it wool or vice versa you have a linen shirt and a woolen jacket, no problem. But if you attach them together, that's shotness. That's us. We can begin to relate to it. What, what's in it? Not that we cannot explain why it is, or what's the reason, but we can even relate to the whole concept. And the same thing applies to many chukim. And that's the principle of the word chukah. It's a godly decree that exists only by virtue of the fact that God is with us and God gave us the decree. If you take, so to speak, God out of the picture, then it, then it doesn't exist. The whole decree doesn't exist. We, can, we don't take God out of the picture, but nevertheless, if you start explaining don't rob and don't steal, you can explain it within the world, the context. Eidos, you can explain it in the world, the context. But hooking, you cannot explain in the world, the context. Hooking don't exist even as a statement if you, without recognizing a godly presence. And this is of, of tremendous significance for us to understand the power of the chukim. When the chukim actually define the true meaning of the Jewish people and Torah. God created everything in the world. From the inanimate, from the rocks and the hills and the oceans and the vegetation. If anybody doesn't understand something that I say on account of the language, please stop me. Vegetation, animals, and then the humans. And among the humans, He created two sets, two categories. And he himself distinguished between them. We have all the people, the Gentiles, what's known and called the Gentiles, we have the entire world of people, and the Jewish people. And how are the Jewish people distinguished from all the rest of the, of the human kind? They're also human, and they also have an intellect. In the, and, and completely different than the animals of intellect. And traditionally we know that that Goyim, other nations, had a lot of wisdom coming out from them, a lot of smarts. Many of the great world known philosophers were Goyim. And they're quoted all over. They're quoted even in in in, in Torah. Oh, what? Not the great what? Philosophers, oh, scholars. The Rambam quotes from Aristotle and others. So they, they had a lot of lot of great power, so to speak, in the brain, in the mind, and yet they are in category 
by themselves and the Jewish people in the category of themselves. What is the clear distinction? What is the difference? And the difference is expressed in this hook or concept. Hashem gave the Goyim also mitzvahs. There are seven mitzvahs that Hashem gave to the Goyim. They are known as seven mitzvahs b'nei nayach. Seven mitzvahs b'nei nayach. And they are obligated to keep these mitzvahs a godly decree. Which means that God actually relates to them. Gave them mitzvahs. He wants them to behave in a certain way in, in His world. But all of these mitzvahs pertain to maintaining an orderly civil life in the world. They're not mitzvahs whose object it is to include, incorporate God in your life. A goy is not obligated to recognize God. He's not allowed to speak negatively. He's not allowed to curse to say bad things about God. But he doesn't have to pray, he doesn't have to buy, he doesn't, he's not obligated to, to serve God. What the, does that mean, uh, um, I'm sorry, um, uh, no. does that mean that a non could be an atheist, not so? As long as he does not spill, speak negatively, he doesn't have to recognize God in his life. Then he can be an atheist. Well, and it depends what you mean by him. If he cannot speak negatively, an atheist is one who says, I, you know, is against it. He's, he then generally has not to be against it. He cannot be against it. But he doesn't have to incorporate that into his life. Yeah, he can lie, lead a normal life without incorporating, including God, God in his life. As long as he doesn't steal, doesn't rob, doesn't kill, and doesn't do all the seven mitzvahs that he is obligated to do. Okay. Huh? Uh, I didn't know this before. Yeah. In other words, his life is designed to be on the worldly arena, the worldly level, but within that, he has to respect, he has to know that this world it's not his to destroy. It's not his to do whatever he wants with it. He was, he was given custody of the world. He was given permission to use it. He has to use it with respect. It's not his to destroy. You can build. You're allowed to build anything you want. The Rebbe was asked one time when they were, when they had this whole big plan to fly to the moon. So the Rebbe was asked, whether there's anything wrong with that, with that idea, human beings flying to the moon. You know, human beings are supposed to be on the earth, not on the moon. Mm-hmm. The Rebbe says there, is, I don't, there, is, there are no prohibitions in the Torah against exploring anything in the, in the universe, as long as you are treating it with respect. You don't destroy anything. Use it in a positive and a productive manner. The Jewish people were singled out. And God declared them as being His people, meaning representing His presence in the world. And this is expressed most sharply in this hook of concept. But as we said, chukah, the whole concept of chukah does not exist. No mitzvah exists without a commander. But at least you can explain what the mitzvah is. Don't rob. Don't, don't rob against your, your friend. The truth is that you should not rob because God doesn't want you to rob. I told you not to rob. You shouldn't destroy because God said not to, not to destroy and so forth. But that's something which is more deep, which is, so to speak, on a different dimension of the mitzvah. The mitzvah itself can be explained within a worldly context. Chukah, you can't even express it. 
without incorporating, without including ungodly persons. In this Pasha, which begins with the word Chuka, and here the word Chuka is used in a very broad way. Usually Chuka is, is used to denote um, a specific mitzvah, like it says Chukas HaPesach. The Chuka associated with Pesach. Pesach has Chuka. You have to eat the Pesach in a certain way. The corn Pesach. Corn Pesach has to be boiled on fire. You're not allowed to cook it. Now, what is the difference when you take a sheep and you cook it or you boil it on fire? You have to cook it all in one piece. You cannot take it apart. These are all cooking. These are all cooking part of the mitzvah of Pesach. And there are many other such chukim associated with various mitzvahs. And it's called in the Torah, chukas hapesach. And this chukim, in this passion, it's called not chukas hapora, because it talks about the poro aduma. I'm sure you're all familiar, right? It talks about the poro aduma, the red hand hyphen. It's not, it doesn't say, it's not called chukas hapora, it's called chukas hatoiro. What does chukas hatoira mean? And this is a chuka that denotes, that tells you, that speaks not about Torah by itself. It speaks about the whole Torah. And this chuka is representative of the whole Torah. It's called chukas hatoira. Because as, as we explained just now, that chukko is truly representative of the principle of what Torah means to the Jewish people. The Torah is to distinguish the Jewish people from the rest of the world, and that's a quest of chukko. That's why chukko is really telling us what the Torah is, not just what a particular deen, particular law is. This is, in essence, true regarding every chukah. It says a chukah, he doesn't have a means for us to understand it and to relate to it in our orientation, then it means that it's a chukah, it's a godly chukah. But this term, chukah satoyle, is used specifically here in this passage. It's not used elsewhere. I pass a spot aduma. This is where the Torah calls it chukas atoyra. Now we want to really understand why por aduma, why is por aduma different than all other chukim that the Torah choose to express the principle of chukas hatoyra by por aduma. He could have said there is chukas apor. It says chukas hatoyra. Which means that this hook over here is, was chosen to be that vocal point where the whole aspect of Torah is actually um, expressed as a hook. All right. Should we take half a minute uh, break for everybody to wake up? I'm sorry? Oh, really? Oh, 
Um, okay. What is unique about the Chukas HaPoro from all other Chukas? So the Rebbe in the Sikha explains the uniqueness of Poro. Poro Aduma is that mitzvah that that is an, and that enables someone who became Tomei, Tomei Mess, by coming in contact with a with a dead human body, and becomes Tomei. And what does Tomei mean? That he cannot relate to Kedusha. He's not allowed to go to Mishkon. He's not allowed to go to Zamikdosh. He's not allowed to eat Korbanis. In order for him to rise up from this tumor, in all other tumors, when a person becomes Tome, then he goes to Mikra, basically, and he becomes Tome. Tumor's mace is such a tumor that Mikra alone does not raise him up from this tumor. He has to go to Mikra, of course. But in addition to that, he has to use this ashes of the Torah Duma. The ashes of the Pora Duma mixed with what's called in the Torah Mayim Chayim. Living waters. Waters coming from a living spring. And then that's thrown on him, sprinkled on him, and that elevates him, raises him from the tomb. So, you may think that the tomb of, of Thomas Mace this tumor in coming in contact with a dead body is the most severe type of tumor. But in fact, if you look at the halachis, you look at the dinim associated with tumor, we find that tumor smase is not one of the most severe tumors. It's actually one of the least severe tumors. Because we know that a tome, a person who is tome, is supposed to be Segregated, you cannot be, you cannot enter certain places. So a mitzvah, a mitzvah, you learned, I'm sure. Anyway, there's a certain tumor called mitzvah. He is segregated outside of the of the community completely. He's not allowed to live within city limits. He has to be outside of city limits. Then there is a zav who can live in city limits. But he cannot live in 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 Yerushalayim. So, somebody who has a different kind of a tumor, and and um, and uh, and Tommy Mass is even allowed to be in Yerushalayim. He cannot go into the Azor. He cannot go in Har Habais on the on the, on the Temple Mountain. What's called? What's called? Yeah. So, okay. so so he's the least of these categories. The least severe. And yet, the Torah is, 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 is making such a tremendous, is, is expressing such a tremendous concern. How is this person become Torah? By going to Mikvah, it's not going to help him. He has to have four other. <clears throat> and the Gemara actually says that when Hashem started talking to us, to Moshe Rabbeinu, about the Torah and Mass, so the expression is niskarkem upon of Moshe. At Moshe's face became this contorted. He became concerned. Like it. How is this person ever going to rise up from this tomb? What's so severe? What's so terrible about this tomb? Why can he, can't you rise out of this tomb? Out of what? Huh? Out of what? Out of this tumor. And the principal difference between this tumor and all other tumors is that in all other tumors you're talking about a living person. Like a Metzoyra. Metzoyra is somebody who is leprosy. It's a very severe tumor. In terms of the degree of tumor, it's very severe. But he's still alive. As long as the person is alive, that means that he has still in him the godly spark 
is still alive. And this godly spark itself does not become Tome. It's all, it's only the externals, the body becomes Tome. The Neshama cannot become Tome. So therefore he's got the healthy part in him. And this healthy part can be induced, can be brought out to heal all other unhealthy parts. This is the, the principle of medicine in general. The principle of medicine is, there are different kinds of medicines, but the best type of, of medicine is that you, you, you give extra strength to the healthy part of the person, and that healthy part of the person overcomes the, the weak part, the sick part, and then he becomes healthy. As long as a person is alive, and he has, and every person has health aspect in himself, you have to focus on the healthy part of the person, and this will overcome the unhealthy part. And, and therefore, you can come, rise up from Tumas. Tumas mace is in different category. Because we're talking about a mace, something has lifeless. Lifeless means that the Neshama has departed from the group. If the Neshama has departed from the group, there is nothing left in there which can be now enticed to come out and to heal and to purify and to elevate. There's nothing left. And this is what the mother says, Niskar Kimupon, Meshe Rabbeinu was contoured and says, how can this ever be elevated? How can this ever be purified? Within the worldly context, there is nothing left, nothing, no God, no spark of life left in us. How can this ever be cured? Just to diverge for a moment, I want, I'll come back to this. This principle, this principle, that every person, no matter where he, what experiences he had, and where he had gotten involved with, and how distorted this thinking is, there is definitely a healthy spark in him. And it is the job and the task of anyone who wants to help him is to find and identify that healthy spark and show him where he relates to the, to the good, to the truth. It is important to show a person not what he, where he is wrong. Show him where he is right. When you show him when he is right, then that relates him to good. And says, oh, I, I, really? I can also think straight? I thought I was all confused. I, I was completely out of it. Once explained, I'm looking at the watch because I have to leave a little bit early today. Sight, I always speak about sight because it's a very important quality that we have, it's a godly gift. This brings the world, the reality to us. Somebody who has for sure does not have sight, you know, right? Look like you're in pain. Somebody who has, doesn't have sight, out to deem, he's, he's, considered, he's spotted from all the mitzvahs. And the reason for that is because he doesn't have a yitzvah hara. Or doesn't have a Yetzir Hora. The simple explanation is Yetzir Hora is drawn to the world. 
and is drawn to the world only when it, the world seems to be real. But someone who does not see doesn't have a real world. The world to him is an imagination. It's not real. Touch alone doesn't make the world real. Sight is what makes the world real. That's why the Torah says, doesn't say there's a surah achrei levavchem v'achrei yideichem. Oh, I touch something I want. It doesn't say that. It says when you see something you want. Because sight presents the world in such real terms that, that the Yitzhah Horah wakes up and says, I want it. I'm sorry? That's right. I'm sorry? What about taste? I'm sorry? What about taste? Taste. Taste for food. Taste for food also comes after sight. You know that the halochi is, the din is, that we have to light candles Shabbos by the table. You know the reason we need candles Shabbos by the table? Excuse me? You could see them. So why do you need to see? Because Shabbos, one arm? To bring light. Why do you need light that kid? And, and what happens if you see? Huh? That's right. Because because you have to enjoy your meal. And if you eat and you don't see, you don't enjoy it. Even if it is tasty. But a person has to see what he eats. And this is one of the reasons you have to have candles on the table. So you can so tell that, that you have the oinik Shabbos from, from the meal. There are other reasons, but this is the primary reason. So, yes, you have taste, but taste without sight is not, is not an enjoyable thing. Sight is the first thing that becomes real. So, come to the point which I want to point out. So, someone who is Rahmanus and sightless is, is really um, in an imaginary world, doesn't have a real world. But there's a big difference between someone who has never seen, that would be it, or someone who had seen and lost his sight. Someone who had seen at one time, even if now temporarily he lost his sight, that would be it. Still the world is real to him because he has experienced it, he knew it. In, in contrast to someone who was never seen, huh? Yeah, in this situation, if someone, God forbid, loses the sight, do you think, does he become a for a Yes. But still, in the personality, there's a difference. Still, you have to see what you want. And the, the halach is the same. So, but we understand the difference. Because it seen, you can, there is something that can be developed. This is the point which I'm making, <coughs> that any amount of good that remains embedded in a person's mind, in a person's heart, even if it is very deeply hidden, it can be very, it can be revealed. Because it is, it's still there, as long as the person is alive. But death, death is a total separation of Shona and Guru. There's nothing to salvage. Nothing, no, no basis for which to build this person up again and bring him back to life and bring him back to Tara. And this is why the whole concept of Tara from Tumas Meis is something which perplexed Moshe Rabbein. And what did Hashem say to him? That really, that is really impossible within the context of the created world. But the chukas atoyra, the chukas atoyra is capable of healing even that. Why? Because as we explained, chukas atoyra represents not a chukah, a, a decree that is understood within worldly context. The chukah represents the godly presence. Not the person, the spark in the person. But the godly presence in the world. And the godly presence in the world is able to be metahir and to elevate even a mace. This is one of the powerful things that we say in davening every day. It's one of the major brachas in davening is mechayi ha 
עצמי חי המייסים את המוח. השם פרוטקט אס, השם גיבס אס ויזדם, גיבס אס לייב, גיבס אס הלף, וסופוורט. ואז מחי המייסים. ומחי המייסים פרינסיפל איז, that this is a statement that no matter where we are in the world, there is something bigger in the world than the world. There is a godly presence in the world. So even a dead world is alive. Because the world is alive from godly presence, not from itself. It would be completely lifeless on its own. It's still alive because there is a godly presence. Because this is God, God's creation. And God maintains it. I once mentioned, many times mentioned, and, and, and the, the story of somebody asked the Rebbe, very briefly, if there would be a nuclear war, so then the world would be destroyed. Because the Rebbe said nuclear war is possible. So he said then the world would be destroyed. The Rebbe said, to destroy the world is impossible. How can you say you can destroy it? It's impossible to destroy the world. It's a physical world. If you can destroy this table, why can't you destroy a thousand tables? Everything in the world is destructive. Why can't you destroy the world? And the answer is, because the world, we see the world as uh, based on its, own, on, on its own parameters. It's a world with parameters. It exists because the earth, this rock exists, this water exists, this and No, that's not true. The world exists because God wants it. That is the real presence of the world. This is what, ex- what express, is expressed in the world. Not its existence. And therefore, it's indestructible. It's indestructible. By the way, again, I just also want to miss the opportunity to say that this applies to every individual person also. Every person has its challenges. And you say, oh, I've reached the end of my life. No such thing. The reason you're here is not because of your capabilities, but because God wants you here. And there's no such thing. You can pursue and continue to do what you need to do and follow it and, and you'll be successful. Because it's not your doing. Huh? Because it's not your You're doing. God is in charge of you. God is in charge of you. God is the one who, who, who provides the koiches, even if, if it's completely lifeless. This is, the, the world exists because God exists. Because God wants it. And this is the chukas ha-toyre. Chukas ha-toyre is to tell us that what, what is... Torah, and what is the Jewish people, what is the world? A Godly presence. And it's expressed in the fact, it shows in the fact that it can, that it can break Tahara, even when you talk about something completely lifeless. Tahara? Purity. Elevation. Even something that in, on its own has no potential whatsoever of growth, of coming up. It has no life anymore. This is the categorical um, end of existence. So, I'm not going to be able to, to finish everything I wanted to say. I just want to mention one little point. One of the things that are used in bringing Tahara to this Tumas Meis. Tumas Meis, huh? Ta- used. One of the things... Wow, what is, what is your, the ashes of the Torah? And these ashes are mixed with what's called Mayim Chayim, living waters. We explained in, in our class what is living waters, what's mind chayim. Mm-hmm. In the world, there's a lot of water. There's oceans of water, an abundance of water. Huge bodies of water, we can't even begin to surmise what that contains. All these waters cannot serve for for Adum. Can take water from the ocean? What can be abundance? No. It has to be from a little spring. A little spring. That's why I'm high. A little spring. 
where the water comes in little trickles, a burp, you know what a burp is? It, 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 it kind of uh, gives off a, a spring. I don't know if you ever saw a spring. It's a very interesting thing. Right in the middle of a rock, there's a little opening, and it, and it kind of blurps out a little a drop of water, and then another drop of water, and goes on indefinitely, continuously. Poof, 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 poof. This water goes indefinitely. And only gives us a little sprinkle, a little drop. That's called Maim Chaim. What's so great about this Maim Chaim? It's a little drop of water compared to, to the ocean. And the answer to the question is this. The ocean is a huge body of water. But it's a body of water that exists and it has worldly parameters. It is there. As, as a presence in the world. No matter how big it is, so to speak, it's defined by worldly uh, parameters and measurements. This blurb of water does not have a worldly explanation. It doesn't have a big body of water. It's the way the image created it, it's, it's sort of, it's coming from nowhere. Some kind of, of a, of a, of a hidden, resource that creates water from nothing. It's like yes, me, I. It just comes. This is called living waters. What's living waters? Living waters means that the waters are there not because you have an, you have a, a reservoir of water. It's just being created. It shows that there is a, li- a living spring in the in the earth that is constantly producing water. This living spring is more significant in terms of Torah and Yiddishkeit than the entire body of accumulated water. This living spring, this is the symbol of the living God. This is the symbol of the chukah. What we see is a huge world, and we think the world exists on its, on its big mountains and rocks and waters and so forth. No. It's a hidden power that's completely obst- obstructed from the world, and it is the godly will that constantly feeds it life. And this is what maintains what the world is. This is the highest of the world. So this living spring, this is representative, this is symbolic of the fact that what is actually existing in the world, not the world, its existence, but the Koyach Aleki, the Godly force, the Godly power behind it. Just as this spring is constantly renewed every second. My time is up, just want to conclude quickly so I understand that every person, every person who lives on this principle, our koiches, our abilities are renewed on a daily basis. This is why we start today from the beginning, from scratch. Yesterday you said, Moida Ani, you finished the whole davening. And today you start from, from the beginning again. And this beginning is a new beginning. It's like you never did it before. Because it emanates from the source. You're not repeating what you did yesterday. You start from scratch. It emanates from the new, from the source. This is what keeps, this is what the, the real life force in us, this is the real source a blessing and success for every individual person and for each one of us over here. And I must run, so I have to cut it short. Next time.